How many times have you been to a seminar, you've taken a course, you've read a book, whatever it is, and you go, oh my God, this makes so much sense. I'm going to start doing this and my life is going to change. And then, you know, a few days later, a week later, you're back to the same old patterns of behavior. You're not doing the stuff that you set out to do. And that's because consciously we go, yes, the conscious mind goes, this makes so much sense. We're going to do this. It's going to change everything. Subconsciously, the subconscious mind going, is going, of course it makes sense, but for everybody else, not for us, because we're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not talented enough. So we're not even going to try. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast. If you're looking to hear stories of hope, inspiration, and turning your greatest adversities into your advantage, well, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Jason Lachance, and through my addiction recovery and struggles with anxiety and depression, I dug into my passion of speaking with people who have transformed their lives. And my guest, John Moyer, he's a master hypnotist and a certified consulting hypnotherapist, as well as an award-winning stand-up comedian. Not only did John and I have a lot of laughs in this conversation, but get some genuine insight from him on how you might want to question, are you hypnotized daily? And what exactly are you under the influence of when you're in a subconscious state? He also shares how the doubt of one of his parents actually propelled him to his career choices in life. Plus, we also discuss examining your relationships and how being in the right relationship can fuel a positive life. His YouTube channel gives away free information on how you can start to reprocess and reprogram your neuro pathways for a more prosperous life. And thank you for checking out Knocking Doors Down. Please hit that subscribe button, give a thumb up to the video, turn the bell on so you get alerts when new content comes out from Knocking Doors Down. And please, Leave a comment on what you thought of this episode. And while you're at it, if you're finding value in knocking doors down, please share with another person. Might need your services. Uh, I still have some areas of blockage in my addiction recovery, but uh, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Jason, for having me. I, I appreciate it. And yeah, we can just, uh, we'll just going to chat up the mind and go wherever it takes us. Yeah, I, I stumbled upon some of your videos on YouTube, and I'm like, ah, I got to find this guy. So we're <laughs> fortunate with the- I'm glad the, you did. Yeah, the technology of the internet. But I'd like to start with gratitude. I, I think it's just one of the most imperative things we can have oh, yeah. in life for a mindset. So three things you're grateful for today, John. I, you know what? I'm grateful for my wife because uh, I- And one of the things that I always say um, when I do my hypnosis programs and stuff is like, what sustains you in gratitude? Like something doesn't make me grateful. So I always say my wife sustains me in gratitude and I'm great. And not to sound cliche, but I'm, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to connect with you and just be here and talk about the stuff that I'm passionate about and, and, uh, you're passionate about. And I am grateful that I have my brand new road podcaster too to help me sound a little bit better when I'm talking to you and the whole uh, tech setup. Uh, that is a cool setup. Uh, we could get off on the total wrong podcast just talking about technology. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> Quick, I, but, uh, it's been a learning curve for me, just making sure my voice sounds good when I try to record myself putting people to sleep. So. <laughs> uh, you know, I've never thought of gratitude the way that you put it. Um, you know, because we can lose sight of gratitude in an instant. Yeah. You're, you're, you're and, the, and the funny thing is because, you know, when, yes, what are you grateful for? And one way it, it maybe can seem so overused or cliche, but you know, it really shifts somebody's thoughts and your emotional state. I mean, so that's one of the, the big things that I always encourage people. Look, if something, man, if you're stuck in traffic and you're angry and you're pissed or whatever it is, if you can just go, you know what? Well, what am I grateful for right now? Well, guess what? I've got 10 fingers that can hold onto the steering wheel. I actually have a car that starts and isn't broken down or just the little, if you can just do the littlest things and then what I call it is compound gratitude. Cause what happens is you start with the littlest things and then it compounds and then you're training your mind to constantly look around for, you know, what's working in a situation instead of what's not working in a situation, what you're, you know, what you're grateful for. And that obviously, you know, is going to change somebody's thought patterns and their emotional states. And of course, if, you know, you're somebody that comes from more esoteric law of attraction, we're putting energy and vibration out there perspective, then that's going to compound that 
um, you know, even more because it's not it, it, when somebody's we look at a lot of things, you know, here's this course, here's this book with 100 concepts on how we can completely change and improve our lives. And we overthink it sometimes and we overcomplicate it sometimes. But when you can just go with the littlest, smallest, tiniest thing that you go, you know what? I'm focusing on this right now, focusing that I'm grateful for for this. That just compounds and snowballs and it changes everything. So we don't have to overthink it or overcomplicate it. Just yeah. gratitude is the simplest place to start from. And I think a lot of people, and I'm guilt, I was guilty of this. Um, really, my sobriety has been such a gift to to it, is I would sit in the rumination of it. I would just, just sit in ponderance yeah. of so many things. Like I was talking to someone, they're like, Yeah, I've been to 15 uh personal development self-help conferences. I'm like, awesome what what's changed in your life well not much it's like yeah. well, when are you waiting for the approval to take action yeah well that's the thing that i tell people i'm like look how many times have you been to a seminar you've taken a course you've read a book whatever it is and you go oh my god this makes so much sense i'm going to start doing this and my life is going to change and then you know a few days later a week later you're back to the same old patterns of behavior you're not doing the stuff that you set out to do and that's because consciously we go, yes, the conscious mind goes, this makes so much sense. We're going to do this. It's going to change everything. Subconsciously, the subconscious mind going is going, of course it makes sense, but for everybody else, not for us, because we're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not talented enough. So we're not even going to try. So really making a change starts on getting into the, on that subconscious level and rewiring the subconscious mind. And because that's the, that's the, that's the operating system, right? That's where all our programming's at. And whether we realize it or not, it's all in there. There's stuff that we do. We have maybe no reason why we do the things that we do, but there's a connection inside the subconscious mind that makes things the way they are, that makes us think certain things and feel certain things, behave in certain ways. So if you can get in there and make that change on that subconscious level, then everything else is just going to fall into place. Yeah, I've I've talked with a few experts about neuroplasticity. And did you really kind of come into this concept when you started studying hypnotherapy? Or were you kind of a person that you kind of grew up like in a home of gratitude and pretty switched oh. on parents or <laughs> no? <laughs> that was that was that definitely was that was definitely not me. Okay, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> um well what happened with me is when I started to do hypnosis. I started um, doing stage hypnosis. So I was a stage hypnotist. And because I had done stand up comedy for over 20 years. And so coming from that perspective of the entertainment medium was what most interested me and most fascinated me. So I start doing stage hypnosis. And then I'm obviously seeing that hypnosis is real. I'm seeing the experiences that you know people are having while they're hypnotized. So I was just like, okay, well, can that, um, can it work on me? And there was a time that I never thought in a million years that I could ever be hypnotized, but I'm like, I'm hypnotizing other people. I deserve to, you know, see if this will work on me. And then when I went through my uh, certification uh, training through the national guild of hypnotists, when I was taking, you know, I, cause I, I, you know, even though I wanted to do just pretty much the stage hypno hypnosis, I also wanted to be, trained and certified in the area of stuff like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, hypnotherapy type of thing. And that's when I realized that I could be hypnotized because it was happening to me. And of course I, it's like going to the gym, you know, when you walk into the gym, you're not going to bench press 400 pounds right away, whatever, you know, it, you start with a few weights and then you work yourself up and you work yourself up. It's the same way with hip, hypnosis. We can all, we all naturally experience hypnosis every single day. It's a natural operational state of, of the human mind. So it does happen to us. So when the people, people, I can't be hypnotized. No, you actually are every single day. It's like <clears throat> talking to your kids when they're staring at their phone screen, they're completely oblivious <laughs> to what that's, you know, it's, it's, that's hypnosis, but it's learning then to actually trigger that state of mind. That's, you know, that's, that's the key, but, you can do it and we can all do it. And once you start doing it, that's when you can go in and, you know, make, you know, make the changes for me early on, there was something that I wanted to be able to work on, you know, being more assertive or being able to, you know, 
for lack of a better word, say stand up for myself, not necessarily in a contentious way, but I realized that, you know, being able to speak my voice and being a little bit more assertive was something that I, you know, I, I deserve to do. So all I did, I was just listening to some, um, some hypnosis audio programs for that, some guided meditations for that. So I'm listening, you know, a week, a week is going by, you know, I'm not noticing any different. I'm not feeling any different. A couple of weeks go by and I, it might've been even like the third week into just listening to the same thing every single day. All of a sudden a situation came up that my response was completely different. Hmm. My response was the response that I was looking to be able to have through what I was doing through these guided meditations and hypnosis programs. And it was just like a light went on all of a sudden I completely, I, I was able to respond completely differently, think and feel differently within the situation and behave differently. And it was just, it was weird because, you know, any of the time leading up to that, there was nothing that I was, no thoughts, no feelings that were needed. But in that moment, all of a sudden when that happened, boom. Mm -hmm. um, it, and, and it's funny too, because it was the, the same, that same moment was all of a sudden when I, I always, I never loved heavy metal music, could never get behind heavy, heavy <laughs> right. but then that switch went on my mind about something else switched. And all of a sudden I wanted to start listening to heavy. I saw, I started listening to heavy metal music and I was like, oh my gosh, I get this. I actually like this. I understand this. So it was just really surreal kind of um, ancillary thing that happened within my mind that all of a sudden I started to, you know, not. I mean, I'm not the full on metal head, you know, like right. the guys that are walking around with the t-shirts and whatever, but I, my mind opened up to a completely new genre of, of music and I discovered the difference. Wow. That is, that is fascinating. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you get a lot out of this podcast, share with a friend and don't forget the archive of interviews we have. Bam Margera, Brandon Novak, Kat Von D, Charlie Sheen, Edward Furlong, Kelly Osborne. The list goes on and on of amazing guests that have been on the podcast sharing how they have found purposeful lives. Speaking of purpose, how about a lifestyle brand with purpose? 5150 LTM. That's right. Not only is it a lifestyle brand that can fit whatever it is you're trying to achieve in life, but they give back to the community. And you, the listener of Knocking Doors Down, get 20% off every time you shop at 5150 LTM. All you have to do is use the code KDD20 at checkout and get 20% off. And how does 5150 give back to the community? Portions of the sales benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation. Their three amazing programs, the race to end the stigma, the race for autism, and the race to be drug free. More on the Carlos Vieira Foundation, go to carlosvierafoundation.org. I've heard that. I mean, I my, the best I can relate to that, John, is my, my kids through their music lessons both have gotten into classical, especially, especially my youngest. And so, you know, got me off onto this... This one that, you know, hey, play play Shostakovich. Okay, put it on in the car. Then I'm like, oh, this is very remnant. You know, it, I can hear this is like the precursor to metal. Like, yeah, you know, as a guy that's a terrible musician, but I can still <laughs> hear the connection. And, uh, and and it's like, wow, okay. And then all of a sudden I'm I'm requesting it. And it's weird how our, our brain, we get beautiful situations where our minds open up. And either yeah. we listen or we go, oh shit, no, that's too much and 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 run away. And I feel yeah. I'm in a place of of where it's more open now. Yeah. And that's well, the thing is, is that you know, our mind operates from patterns. We're all every situation, everything that we're at, our minds looking for, okay, well, how do we understand this? How is you know, okay, we've been through this before. This is the pattern we know how, you know, to operate. And when you can interrupt that pattern, if you're looking for a different result, you know, that's where being able to access the subconscious mind and, you know, erase and rewrite and, and rewire everything helps you be able to get out of the same pattern. So you can start having different outcomes that you actually prefer to be the case. Have you worked with anyone that's, uh, you know, maybe struggling coming out of their addiction or new to recovery? I, I have, well, well, there's, I have not specifically worked with anyone within um, re addiction recovery. Mm -hmm. um, I did a few years ago. It was interesting. I did do, I performed a show though, 
for, it was an addiction recovery group. Um, they had hired me to do, uh, you know, their, their entertainment for them up in, uh, up at a, an event in Park City, Utah. Um, but very much, you know, kind of tailoring what I understood about meditation in the mind mm. to the situation that, um, that they were in. One of the interesting things that we found is people with addiction, you know, it doesn't make any difference whether it's alcohol, drugs, shopping, gambling, whatever it is, they have uh, low levels of GABA or it's GABA, a gamma, but it's a long word, GABA, a <laughs> butyric acid. Right. But G-A-B-B-A, if you look it up, gamma, you'll say, it. but it's a chemical within, within, uh, within our brains. So people with addictions have low levels of GABA. Now, one of the things that happens when you meditate or you're doing hypnosis, I mean, there's, there's sister states of mind that increases your levels of GABA within your brain. So it's something that can be an added boost for people that are looking, you know, to overcome some type of of addiction that they can do this meditation and have this chemical naturally increase within their, within their brain to help with, you know, the, the stuff that, that they're going through. Wow. I've never, I've never heard of that chemical. Obviously, you know, I've uh, yeah, I'm, studied I'm, the big four dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, <clears throat> endorphins, and so much and how that, you know, the addict's brain as it relates to that. But um, no, I, I've, I've never been aware of that. Yeah, it is. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm just looking here to how the full pronunciation of GABA. Abut Let's see here. Uh, how is it? Two B's. It's one A. Is it, uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, all right. GABA. I'm looking up here on the computer and it's. Uh, yeah. All right. If it goes to the top here, gamma amino butyric acid. There you go. So huh. G-A-B, G-A-B-A, not two B's. So gamma amino butyric acid. There you go. That's interesting you bring that up because I've noticed when I lack in my prayer meditation, I put them one in the same. Um, some of the times it's when maybe a, what a past trigger would, I'd be a little more sensitive to it. I, I mean, yeah. I've, I've gotten far enough along in my recovery. You never say never till I, you know, return to the earth, so to speak. But mm -hmm. um, I, I'm pretty solid in my recovery and, and being able to reach out or process. But I do notice that. So it's pretty interesting. I Thank you. That's uh, yeah. really, really insightful. Yeah. It, well, and you know, the other thing too is obviously, you know, for you experiencing, um, you know, being in addiction recovery, you know, that there, there are certain things, certain patterns that your mind would have, you know, linked to, okay, this situation is this way. And my response would normally be, you know, to do this or this or this, but you know, if you're using meditation or hypnosis, you know, you can help, you know, rewire those connections. <clears throat> so you're pulling, you know, the plug from one connection for whatever, you know, substance or alcohol, whatever it is. And saying, okay, now we're going to disconnect that connection. We're going to plug that into, um, you know, something else. So we don't have that same um, response. Yeah. How how has it really played out in your life? We could, <laughs> I made reference to childhood and parents, and <laughs> uh, you know I'm always fascinated how people fall into very intriguing professions. To me, yeah. it's very intriguing. I mean, it's something I would love. I wish we lived closer because I'd want to sit with you and talk, and you know, much like we are here. Um, kind of tell me about little John. I'm curious. The the thing for me was uh, my father. I I, I look at you know, probably the biggest genesis of, you know, or the, the fuel that propelled me. Um, my father was an incredibly talented musician. My father loved big band music, you know, Glenn Miller, that sort of thing. He played the drums. In fact, he had his own big band orchestra. And, but my father was, you know, his belief were, if you have a talent like that, that's your hobby. That's what you go and you do on the weekends for fun. A real man works 40 hours a week at a regular job, even if he hates it. And that's how he supports his family. And my father actually wound up going to work at his grandfather's company, which he spent, you know, 30, almost 40 years of his life uh, working at. And he would go out on the weekends with his, you know, with his, his band. But, and my father was a fantastic provider, you know, had no issues with, you know, the, the, you know, the lifestyle that we had, um, growing up, but I also saw my father hated, hated working at his grandfather's company and it caused him a great deal of stress. Um, 
Now, I didn't get the entertainment gene. I mean, I got the entertainment gene from my father. I didn't get the musician gene from my father, but I got the entertainment gene. So when I was about 12 years old, I the funny thing in the, the movie theater that was down the street from our house, there nobody cared about being 17 to go and watching R-rated movies. So we were always going to the movies. I mean, I was 12 years old, right? We're going to see, uh, we went and saw American Werewolf in London, right? So, and it was one of my buddies were like, 10 and nine or whatever. And, you know, here's these kids walking up, going to see this R-rated movie, but I loved American Werewolf in London. And I, this, that's kind of cool. And I went home and I started with my father's super eight millimeter movie camera. I just started making, you know, these home movies with the, you know, with the neighbor kids and stuff. And I just fell in love doing that. Later on, you know, a few years later, I say to my dad, I go, what do you think about me? You know, making movies and going in film school and doing this. And my, and my father was, I think it's another one of your childish ideas. So uh -huh. my father was shooting that down, that that was anything that I was going to pursue. And in that moment, two things happened. Number one, I saw how my father was miserable being stuck working for the man and not only just working for his grandfather's company, but he had this love of music that could not fulfill all the areas, you know, in, in, in his life. So I said, I'm not going to be like my dad in that regard. Number two, my dad just told me that I couldn't do something. So F you, now I'm going to go out and prove to you that I, you know, that I can do it. So I kept making movies in high school, wound up uh, graduating high school, went to film school and got my, uh, got a BA in uh, with a screenwriting emphasis. Now, along the way though, I discovered stand-up comedy while I was in um, while I was in college. And it was all entertainment-based stuff for me. I wanted to write funny scripts. And um, so performing, it just was all part of the, you know, the same thing. And later on, as I was able to achieve some levels of of success and doing what I want to do, and I you know, I never cared about being famous. I never cared about making the most money or anything. I just wanted to be able to make my, you know, support myself and my family doing what I loved to do. As long as I could do that, cool. It's great. Don't have to be the biggest or the best or any of that stuff. And then later on, there was some resentment on my father's part that I was able to prove him wrong and go out and do the things that, you know, I wanted to do. Um, it wasn't spoken, you know, it wasn't specifically my dad saying, I resent you, but I could tell Mm -hmm. through things, the ways and stuff that he treated with me. And before my father died, that was all resolved It all, you know, everything was, everything was good, but that that's what propelled me. So, um, you know, starting to do stand up comedy and along the way I've had, you know, several independent or scripts that I've written, you know, um, produced into independent films. And then of course, doing the stage hypnosis, that was my, you know, just being in front of a live audience, and then, of course, from that to my, you know, my YouTube channel, what I do now. So it's all it, it's this weird, you know, combination of all of these creative skill sets that I've enjoyed doing my entire life, writing and editing and video production and film production and the performance element all kind of tie together in ways that I never would have imagined would have been the case. But such here they are. And I go, man, I feel like I'm living in the sweet spot. I really yeah. feel like I'm able to be creative make a difference as well being creative because that was the one thing when i was doing stand-up comedy great you could go out and make people laugh for 45 minutes or an hour or whatever and you can make them feel good in that moment but i have the opportunity now to be creative that um you know uh, helps people in the long run benefits people in the long run to be able to you know change the quality of their lives Oh, that, that resonates with me a lot. You know, it was uh, at the end of my radio career. That's what I felt. It was like, it's nice that people want to tune in or you play the song they want to hear, give them concert tickets. But yeah. it just it just didn't feel like, I don't know, uh, maybe it's the getting older thing. You want to leave more of a mark that's purposeful or something. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is, but it was like, yeah, my, my, my life needs to change. And that's, you know, that's really what it was for me because um, you know, when I was doing stand-up comedy, the, well, you go to film school, the first rule of sc screenwriting is all, you know, all conflict is drama. Right. So, you know, you're not going to have home alone if the kid doesn't get left home alone and there's burglars trying to break into the house. So I kind of applied that template to what I did in stand-up comedy, whereas that, okay, if I had conflict and drama in my life, then what can happen is I can write jokes about that. 
So the more drama and conflict that I had in my personal life, the more I was able to rant and rave and be funny on stage. Of course, the problem was, is that that was taking a toll on me personally mm. because I was, you know, unhappy personally. Then I went, you know, I wound up going through a divorce and I had, you know, young kids and um, yeah, life was really, really dysfunctional for me personally. But, it, you know, at least I'd say, well, I can go on stage and I can rant about it. But then when I became unhappy about being on stage and wasn't enjoying being on stage because the dynamic of stand-up comedy um, really kind of changed in the early 2000s. Right. Um, where it, it became, you know, when my, you know, when uh, my space came about and Dane cook with my space where it was like, you know, if you were booked at a comedy club, the comedy club was responsible for promoting the shows. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, who do we, who do we want to book? That's got the most friends on my space that they can right. tell you know, about, you know, about the show. So, so there was, a so that the dynamic in that regard changed because there was a lot of freestanding comedy clubs that were open, you know, Tuesday through Sunday, or a lot of, you know, venues that were open all week. And then just a lot of places wound up kind of, you know, shutting down and it went from freestanding comedy clubs to, you know, you know, Bob's sandwich bar and grill doing a comedy night and, you know, in the, in the back room. So just really kind of unhappy, you know, in, within that experience. So, and then what happened for me is that I was doing, I was booked to do an event. I was doing stand up comedy. I was doing, it was like this <clears throat> all day event where there was all these different things happening. And when I was doing my stand up, it was about, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the venue was about half full. And after me, and I didn't realize this, they had a stage hypnotist coming up after me. So I stuck around and watched and, you know, they were half full for my show and that, that was standing room only now for the hypnotist. So I'm like, okay, I'm sticking around and watching this. And of course the audience was engaged. The volunteers were hypnotized, a lot of energy, a lot of fun. And then people after the show were flocking the stage to buy his CDs for stop smoking and weight loss and, you know, all that stuff. So I went, now I was fascinated, kind of fascinated by the mind. So I'm like, okay, I, I want to do that. That looks interesting. I could, I could do, I know how to be on stage and how to talk to people. I know how to improv, just got to figure out how to hypnotize people. Um, <laughs> but once I figured that out, then um, I was able to go back to the agents and the uh, bookers and the event planners and the comedy clubs and stuff. I said, Hey, I've got a whole new show now something completely different. And it just, you know, things took off. My audience base expanded because now I just wasn't hanging out in bars telling jokes. I could go and do university events or high school events, but then I was doing, you know, high-end corporate events. I was performing for Royal Caribbean Cruise Line. So, it, you know, instead of driving 12 hours to do some hell gig, you know, at a cowboy bar, like in, you know, Montana or something. It's like, <laughs> you know, I'm being, people are flying me. They're paying me. They're and not only just paying me to be there, they're flying me to, you know, go do their events. So it was a very nice change. And then, then of course, along the line, I'm like, well, if this stuff, if I can hypnotize people, this stuff works on other people, I'm going to use it on me to change my, right. you know, my life personally. I'm glad you finished sharing that. Thank you. Um, on that note, because it, I found it really fascinating what you were saying about going up on stage, ranting about like, you know, the, the, the drama of your life, so to speak. And and it's I think people don't realize sometimes there, there's another addiction that sits out there that I don't think people understand, especially now more than ever, is they're addicted to drama. Yeah. And if you, oh, yeah. As an entertainer, I mean, if that's what it is, like, I, I can't go to recovery meetings anymore. Like, I've left some where people, like, you can just feel the energy of the mm -hmm. room. It's everybody negative, negative. Like, hey, I'm here for the positivity of, like, sobriety, yeah. you know? Um, so I find it really fascinating that that's where you ended. Like, hey, you know, you if you're pumping out this negative shit all the time, that's exactly how your brain is going to be wired because it's all you're thinking. Knocking Doors Down by Carlos Vieira. Now available wherever you get audiobooks. I wasn't done partying, and I didn't want the binge to end. I think I knew that when I finally got home, I'd have to face what I had done, and I wasn't ready to do that. Being responsible for my actions wasn't something I was looking forward to. I had abandoned my wife and baby, my family, 
and my business. I wanted to avoid the shame of returning to what I had left behind. Even though I was not yet going home, I wasn't sure I had enough resources to continue the binge. Click the link in the podcast description to find out more. Think about, and there's so many layers to what you just said there. So number one, if you think about just social media in general, that has connected all of us. Now, what, you know, and, and that's the thing we, I, when I started doing hip, hypnosis, you know, the statistic was um, people are, you know, you're hypnotized on the average of about a dozen times a day. Mm. And, the, you know, and they, you know, it's like, if you're watching TV, you're reading a book, right. You're driving down the road, you're lost in thought. Those are all forms of hypnosis. But as technology has evolved and we all have phones in our hands that we are literally staring at the entire time. So if you're standing in line at the supermarket, you're waiting in line, wherever you're looking at your phone. And that is literally a form of hypnosis because you're, you're, you're focused on that. Now, what are, what are the algorithms doing? They're, they're feeding us stuff that we feel that we're going to interact with. So it's like you get in some argument about politics on Facebook, you know, with somebody, then all of a sudden the algorithm is going to be like, oh, okay, Jason likes to fight with people over politics. So we're going to keep pushing more of these posts in, you know, in, in his way. So now if you're looking at your phone and of course you're in a hip, hypnotic state, then you're literally now being programmed for that, you know, contentiousness to fight that, you know, that anger. And of course, then we've also created, um, you know, quite a bit, uh, you know, a generation with victim mentality that, you know, we are, you know, the system's rigged. If somebody has money or opportunity, they probably did something, you know, nefarious to get that. And then, you know, all these other things are rigged to get, you know, you're so, you know, you have somebody that gets upset, they see something on social media or something happens, then, then what do they do? They're programmed to go to, you know, right away to social media and make a post about how somebody cut them off on the way to work that day. And, you know, so now it's like, there's this, you know, uh, you know, the ladder that we climb up now, you know, the victims, you know, if you're a victim, you're higher up the ladder now. So it's like people are aspiring to look for everything that's going to go wrong, to upset them, to trigger them so they can rant about it. So they can take on that victim persona and everybody go, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for you. And I feel you know, feel so, feel so bad for you. So we've created, you know, a kind of perfect storm that programs people to aspire to drama and, you know, that, you know, that victim mentality. Well, and I think the dangers of that victim mentality, give me your take on this. I was talking with one of my mentors the other day and, and, uh, I, I, I brought it to him. I was, I handed the map and compass to other people for my life. And I think yeah. being in that victim state that, it, again, so many people, and I spent there, it, it kept me in my alcoholism. It really did. It was a nice crutch and an excuse and everything was everybody else's fault. Uh, it it really does allow us to look then elsewhere for leadership other than the person in the mirror when it comes to our life, which is so detrimental. Like I'm 45. I don't want to waste any more of my life appeasing this person, that person, and and being the image of whatever everybody else yeah. needs. It's like that, that sucks all joy and purpose out of me. And the, you know, the, the biggest problem with that is the fact that we're saying that our emotional states, the way that we think and feel, you know, uh, it's, it's all determined by somebody else. You know, if you do this, then that makes me angry. That makes me upset. That makes me hurt or whatever the case may be. And, and especially one of the things that I always, you know, share some of the themes of my content is, is like, you don't need anybody else to be any different, Mm -hmm. right? You can, it's, you're in charge of your emotional states. You're in charge of how you feel and you can learn to manage those things instead of saying to somebody else, you need to do this so I can feel good about myself. You need to do this so I can feel happy or so I can feel at peace. No, we don't need anybody else to be any different. We have the the ability to, to feel completely at peace and find our own happiness with inside of ourselves, outside of what's going on 
um, you know, around us. Yeah. One of my favorite sayings, everybody can get the shirt in the merch store, uh, no outside solutions to inside problems. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. And (laughs) what we were talking about made me think of one of my relationships uh, (laughs) that uh, the the person I was with at, at the end of it, I was like, they were like, well, a real man would do this and this. And I'm like, I am just filling whatever sort of role for the chess piece that you've put a relationship in your life, aren't I? Yeah. Like yeah. I'm out. Thank you. Yeah. It's, you know, you, and that's, that's the challenge too, especially with relationships is that um, people think that, okay, well, if this person comes into my life, then that's going to make all the difference. That's going to complete me. That's going to fill this void or this or whatever. And, you know, it, we think that the other person is going to make the difference and it's not, you know, you're, you are the person who you are, you're responsible for that. And somebody else coming into your life can amplify who you already are, can complement who, who, you know, you already are, but they're not going to fix anything. They're not going to make you any, you know, make you any different. And that's so many, you know, challenges that people have is they think, okay, I'm going to get in this relationship and that's going to make everything better. And it doesn't, it makes things worse Yeah, because you're, that person's now not being what you expect them to be. Yeah, that was, you know, one of the um, the biggest things that my wife taught me was, really? you know, you don't you know, you don't need other people um, to, you know, be you don't need other people to be any different. And so and it's funny because my it's my third marriage. Right. So I I definitely have a track record of failure when it comes to that. <laughs> and, um, you know, after my second marriage, my kid's mom, who we have a great relationship, you know, I have nothing negative to say um, about her. But I was like, I'm done. I am not doing this marriage thing again. Now, this was all kind of at the same time when I started to do discover hypnosis and meditation and whatnot. And then, so now I'm changing. Things are happening for the better inside of me. And then it's like, I wind up meeting my wife. And if there are any coincidences, there would have to have been 127 completely coincidental things to literally all align at one moment for, you know, for us to come together. Um, but then we, you know, we get together and I'm like, oh, this, this is what marriage is about. This is why people get married. You know, it's not to fill some void. It's not, it's to take you even further of, you know, of who you are. And so the, you know, the joke with my family is third, you know, third time's a charm. And that was the way it was for both of my sisters, their third marriage success. (laughs) I thought I was done, but then number three, I'm like, holy cow. All right. This is what it's all about. And it's bliss. Uh, Well, Hey, my brother's in the same category. So it's all right. Uh, Well, and I think some of the confusion that happens too with people and maybe not understanding, I mean, you know, oh, the butterflies are gone or whatever. It's like, yeah, because your brain had this chemical reaction at first and all these wonderful little feel-good things are pumped into your head. And yeah, those eventually start to dissipate. And I think that that for me in reflection too, I was pretty hooked on like, oh, something must be wrong. I don't feel this anymore. And, uh, you know, there's so many different confusing things that that just go on biologically that, you know, I can, I can, it's, I mean, it sounds so, you know, I don't know if it sounds cliche, but you know, my wife and I have been together now, uh, it'll be 10 years. Um, well, actually it's just a little over, a little over 10 years that we've been together now. And it is still, um, it's more connected. It's more engaging. It's more passionate. There's more love than it, than it just, it sounds crazy to say because like I was no. previous marriages where it's like, okay, you just tolerate each other and then they do their thing and you, but it's <laughs> like, um, it's just everything that and it's things that I couldn't even imagine. No, you know, it, it helped. My wife is, I always brag about my wife cause she's former Mrs. Utah first runner up Mrs. America. Um, but she's also, she's as brilliant as, you know, she is, as she is beautiful. So, but it's like when you meet that right person and the funny thing, because my wife, you know, we're, we're talking about energy, right? Going right. Out there. My, my wife is big into astrology, which mm. I used to kind of be like, yeah, okay, whatever. <clears throat> but when we met, the first question she asked me, she said, when's your birthday? This was literally the first question when we were introduced. She said, when's your birthday? And I said, May 1st. And she said, why is your phone number not in my phone? And because, you know, she was married for 16 years. She went through a divorce. And she said, okay. And she wrote all of this down. If I ever was going to get married again, these are all the things that I am looking for in an individual. And one of 
the things was a birthday of May 1st because huh. she knew that that aligned with her birthday astrologically. And it was funny. She later on pulled out, you know, we'd been together for a couple of years, but she pulled the book out and she was reading everything she read. I was like, it described me and our relationship, you know, to a T, but so yeah, the, the May 1st and astrology, and I think it's actually quantum physics. I don't know that it's foo-foo. I think we're all, you know, we're all entangled particles and then therefore there's an influence over all of us and um, in some way, but I can attest to marrying the right person. So, cause it, you know, when you do it, just, it makes everything a lot easier. Uh, I love to hear that. And congratulations to you both. Um, and I agree. I, you know, I've, I've had the conversations with people about this. It's like, you do realize like on an elemental level, a molecular level, that we're other people are parts of us. If you yeah. think about it and you know, that maybe that's why somebody might connect a little more with the past life or, Maybe astrology plays more into their life or whatever it is. You know, I'm an energy person too. Like I'm empathetic and I can just tell like the vibe of something. And there's certain situations now that I don't numb myself. I'm switched on. It's like, mm, yeah, I'm yeah. out. You know, yeah. I, I know when to check out. Like I can just feel it. Like this is not where I want to be. Yeah. that And that's my, my wife is an empath in that regard that she's able to really just kind of pick up on these, you know, these energies and, um, you know, and it is, we're, we're, you know, we're all about energy. And I think there's things that we're gradually starting to understand now on deeper levels that it's like, oh, this isn't really foo-foo. This mm-hmm. is actually, there, there could be something to what's going on with us relative to the quantum field. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, how much electricity runs through our body? How can you avoid it on a scientific level that, yes, we do have some sort of energy source, vibration, whatever you want to call it. I mean, we we need electrical things running through our body. Well, that's the thing. I didn't even realize this. I just read this a couple of years ago that, the, you know, the pineal gland has got um, calcite crystals in it, which huh. have piezoelectric qualities like a radio trans transmitter so where is that gland in the brain it's kind of at the seat of the brain so So either like the cerebellum or the the medulla uh, oblongata or something i don't know all of the i i know how to hypnotize i don't necessarily (laughs) know all of all the um but yeah it, it kind of sits at the at the seat of the brain and um the pineal gland itself uh you know if you you watch birds and it's like well how do they all know to turn right? Mm-hmm. When they're in a flock at the same time, but now we realize that <clears throat> the pineal gland it's, or has been referred to as the third eye um, because, you know, there's kind of this, you know, if you want to talk in terms of like new age or ancient philosophy, you know, it, it's this ability, that's this third eye to have some type of a, you know, a sixth sense. But now, of course, we know now it's like, oh, well, there's calcite crystals in there with piezoelectric qualities that can you know, transmit and pick up, you know, electrical signals and impulses. So something that we might think is completely, you know, foo-foo, you know, or paranormal or whatever. Is well, guess what? There's a scientific explanation for that. And here's, you know, as we uncover more science, there's things I think in the world of mysticism that we begin to start to go, oh, this makes sense now. I get it. Yeah. I would, the reason I was curious is where, it, you know, about where it is, like how close is it to our primal or people say lizard brain or whatever it is, a, a lot of those subconscious actions. And that's what we kind of started talking about. A lot of the subconscious behavior that we have that maybe in retrospect, we go, what the hell did that happen? Or that was really odd. Yeah. And well, the, yeah, the, the pineal gland is more and it's an interesting and now there's of course, obviously, there's people that have different takes and different perspectives. One of the challenges with the pineal gland is as you get older, it gets calcified. If it gets calcified, then obviously now you're starting to dial down that ability, that kind of sixth sense ability of transmitting and receiving, you know, kind of what we might consider to be mystical, you know, impressions or thoughts or stuff. But, you know, I, I think there's people that have known that, hey, we're we want to intentionally calcify the pineal gland so we can shut off people's ability to connect. And 
So there's a, there's a very big debate about fluoride in water. You know, do we, are they putting fluoride in water because, Hey, it's going to make our teeth better. Are they putting fluoride in water? Because somewhere along the line, somebody, you know, in, in the system said, Hey, we want to calcify people's pineal glands. So we can start to, uh, you know, cut them off from each other as far as their, you know, their ability to have this, you know, extra sensory perception. Well, and I mean, guilty as charged in in many scenarios and points of my life, but, you know, I, I've reflected on how much just subconsciously walking through life occurred for me. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think a lot of people do too, without realizing like, you know, why is my marriage in shambles or why am I so unhappy that they just, they, they, there's not a, a point to sit, reflect and ask like, you know, how do I grow? How do I change the way I see myself, think, act and so on? Yeah, it's just it goes back to the fact that so many people point the finger at other places for things that are wrong in their lives or not working in their lives versus going, all right, it's up to me. What can I do here? How can I make this difference? How can I make this change? Yeah. Uh, boy, boy, I could sit and talk with you probably all day. <laughs> you this, this conversation, I was like, I was excited before it started. Now I'm just thoroughly enjoying it. The time has just flown by. Uh, we'll have to do this again, John, but, um, I, I want to ask a little bit more about, uh, you know, the hypno, hip, hey, hypnotherapy would help if I could talk. Um, And maybe some of the biggest surprises since you've really stepped into that arena, not just personally for you and the work it's done on you, but others. Well, you know, the the biggest thing is, and and probably the most rewarding is seeing how something can influence and benefit somebody else's life. You know, it goes back to, excuse me, whether I was just going on stage, you know, for a few minutes to entertain people for an hour or whatever it may be. But then at the same time, being able to, I could put something out there that influences people on, you know, in the, in the long term. One of the examples I love sharing is when I was performing on the cruise ships, um, you know, I would only have to do two shows in one night for the entire cruise. And I had the rest of the cruise to kind of hang out. And so I, you know, it's not like you're doing a show where you leave, you do the show, and then you're gone. And you never see people again. I would see people, you know, from the, you know, on the ship that had been to the show. And I had, had a woman come up to me and she said, you know, I wasn't going to participate in your show. And I remember who she was because she was one of the, what we would call the stars of the show. She was hypnotized and very animated. And she said, I wasn't going to come and participate at all. But then you said, because this is what I do in my pre-talk is I encourage people to come on stage. I give them a reason why to come on stage. I go, look, you're going to access your subconscious mind. If you have a goal that you want to achieve, something that you want to overcome, or a negative habit you want to stop participating in or a good habit you want to start. Uh, adopting, we can make that happen for you tonight. Hmm. So she goes, when you said that, I wanted to come up on stage. She said, I'm a chocoholic. She goes, and it, maybe it, it's just kind of feeling some, somebody that somebody would be addicted to chocolate, but it was enough for her that it ruled her life in a way that she said, this isn't working for me anymore. And I want to stop eating chocolate. So she goes, I came up. My goal was to stop eating chocolate. She says, it's been three days. Hmm. I have not had any chocolate at all. And she said, my friends can't believe it because out you're on a cruise ship. There's chocolate everywhere, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she goes, it's been three days. I can't believe it. Well, then the funny thing was is, you know, a few years ago, she reached out to me, connected me on Facebook. She said, I don't know if you remember me or not, but I'm the person that stopped eating chocolate on the cruise. She goes, and it's been at that point, I don't know, it was two or three years. She goes, but it's been two, three years. She goes, benefits are still here. I'm, I, I don't have that issue anymore. Wow. So, you know, and that's, you know, I see how those you know, the, the tools of hypnosis, the tools of meditation made a difference in my life and changed me for the better. And that's why I'm passionate about being able to say, you know what, I want to put this out for other people so they can have, you know, that experience. And that's, and especially now with the, you know, the reach of something like YouTube, where I can hear from people all over the world that say, thank you, you, what you said here, what you shared here has made a huge difference in my life. Yeah. Well, I'm a subscriber, so I need to dig in more. But I mean, were you surprised? I mean, you, what is it? A couple hundred thousand followers now on your um, YouTube I've, channel I've or got something? Three. It's like three. It's just over three hundred thousand. Yeah. So, so it, it's hitting pretty pretty good. Yeah. I'd say, yeah. You know. And yeah, I, mean, I mean, and I I never expected that to be the case. That's the right. thing. I mean, I, you know, the whole reason why I even started doing uh, having stuff on YouTube is because in the mid two thousands, well, I, you know, I've been doing 
hypnosis since probably about 2012, 2013. But it, you know, the big thing was for hypnotists when they did a show is they had back of the room sales, right? They had CDs. You can come by weight loss and stop smoking, that sort of thing. Well, which is what I had, but then CD players were becoming obsolete. People weren't, they didn't have CD players anymore. <laughs> so now there's this the big debate with the stage hypnotists. Okay, what do we do now? And so hypnotists were like, hey, let's let's take thumb drives and we can you know, put all these, you know, all our programs on a thumb MP3 files. And I'm thinking, okay, that's great. But, you know, somebody buys, you know, you buy, you know, my thumb drive. Well, what's to say you're not going to hand that off to 20 other people who would have bought, you know, their own or whatever. Um, so I just, I said, look, here's what I'm going to do. If I'm going to create MP3 files, I'll put them on my website, tell people to go to my website, they can buy them there. And then I thought, well, I'll put some stuff on YouTube thinking that maybe if they liked what they heard on YouTube, they'd go to my website, they'd buy, you know, stuff that way. Never even occurred to me that people use YouTube as a platform for experiencing meditation and hypnosis. And I wasn't even really um, doing anything with it. I just put some stuff in there and I wasn't even really looking. I go back six months later, I had this one video that really took off. Um, and I was, that kind of clicked. I said, oh, wow. Okay. Well, I, people use YouTube. So I'm going to put a concerted effort into putting content out on, on YouTube. And it just, it took off from, you know, from there. Yeah. It's, it's wild how, and I'll talk to this about newcomers in recovery that, uh, Hey, if you just focus on purpose and doing the next right thing and something that, 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 that feels right, no matter how hard it is, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. You know? and and I, I mean, I would even go so far as, you know, I always tell people there's no right or wrong. There's only if it works for you or not. So it's like if somebody's doing something and they go, I feel like this is working for me in the context of I'm enjoying this. I'm passionate about this. Um, if that's kind of the energy that that space that you're coming from, if you're feeling good and you enjoy it, you know, because no matter how hard you're working at something, you could work your ass off. It could be the hardest thing you've ever done, but if it feels rewarding and you're enjoying it in that regard, then that's where that's, that's what it's all about. You've got, you come from that space of energy and that's how things align and show up for us. Absolutely. Hey, John, people want to connect with you more, follow the YouTube channel. Um, yep. You know, how can they, how can they do so? Uh, of course, obviously the biggest platform would be YouTube. So you can just look me up on YouTube. It's just John Moyer, J O H N M O Y E R. So, um, or if you go to johnmoyer.com, that's got the links to, you know, everything that I've got going on where you can find me uh, on social media and stuff like that. But YouTube is the big place. So check me out there. Yeah, it's a great channel. I highly encourage people and uh, I'm going to have to reach out. I think we need to do some one-on-one -on -one work. I still got, yeah. I got some areas that I think are still trauma based from examination that it's kind of, you know, I kind of want to release They're they're, they're definitely hindrances. Yeah. And my, you know, then that's the thing. My wife is fantastic at all of the one-on-one -on -one stuff. Mm. She, so what the stuff we do together, um, you know, people come to me for that. I say, you know, go, you know, you can check out, uh, you know, my wife is just, she's just, she, cause uh, you know, I, cause I was doing a little bit of one-on-one -on -one stuff, but I'm like, I wasn't passionate about that. Mm. You know, I'm, I, I found, the passion and the reward of creating something that I could put artistically out there for the masses. Sure. Um, and my, my wife is just very passionate about that one-on-one -on -one connection, that one-on-one -on -one experience. So she does really well in that regard. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Hey, let's jump into some fun, random questions, huh? Absolutely. Ask away. I was going to start with who inspires you, but I think you've already answered that it's your wife. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Um, where do you go when you want to be alone? Like when you need that space, you know, here's the funny thing. My wife and I will probably, I mean, we spend 95% of our time together. Mm. Um, cause we're just here at home, you know, we don't, and it's funny. She's, she's actually at a women's, uh, retreat this weekend. So she's going to be gone, um, until Sunday, but before she left, she's like, I miss you already. So I mean, I'm, I don't come from a space where it's like, I need to be, you know, don't talk to me, leave. I don't, you know, just being <clears throat> to me, that space of peace, you know, that serenity now that, um, that right there, it's just being in the company of my wife, you know, we'll, we'll meditate, we'll meditate together. 
Um, you know, even if it's just being in the same room, we're not necessarily, she's doing, working on her computer. I'm working on my computer. We just happen to be at the, you know, the kitchen table together or whatnot. That to me is, is the happy place. That's the, that is the place of peace. If you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? One superpower? What would it be and why? You know, I'd always have, I always think it would be invisibility. I don't know. Maybe there's something, there's something a little twisted on that. You can just kind of <laughs> sneak into a room and hear what people are saying or what's going on. Right. So yeah, I, it, you know, invisibility would be fun. I'd like that. When people have said that or asked me like mine, I got that, that would creep me out. Like I, I'm one of those people like I, and I don't really want to know what you think because it might yeah. screw me up. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I kind of don't. Um, if you could travel anywhere in time, but you had to stay there, where would it be and why? You know, that's a good question because I'm a huge history buff and I've always been fascinated by the concept of time travel. So if I had to go... <clears throat> You know, it's a toss up because on the one hand, you go, I, I wouldn't mind going back to I grew up outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I grew up in South Jersey. So I always think Colonia Philadelphia would be an interesting place. But if I had to stay there, then I would probably go, you know what, maybe I'll just go back to the 80s and um, put some bets in on some games that I knew the outcome <laughs> of, buy some stocks that I knew were going to be the out, buy some real estate. So I'd probably say. If I had to stay there, I'd go back to the eighties because then, you know, I could, I could make a lot of money that way. Yours is so much better than mine because mine has always been like the eighties. A lot of my favorite bands come from that time, you know, Motley Crue and I'm a big Kiss fan and stuff yeah. like that. And I always joke, I'd probably have ended up dead, you know, on Sunset Strip. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I never throw in the, the, the intelligence of well, you know, I could see that when this stem, this company Apple hits the stock yeah. exchange, that would be a good bet. Or when people first start talking about this Bitcoin thing, maybe getting yeah. for about a year. Or, yeah. You know, um, uh, what's something people would be surprised to learn about you? Maybe that's not something that you commonly share or hobbies, interests. Um, people don't necessarily know about me. There's, you know, obviously when people are listening to my meditation, my hypnosis programs, they're um, there's a persona there. That persona, you know, is a part of me, but it's not all of me. So, um, when my wife and I met my, you know, my wife is very sapiosexual, right? So she's, she gets attracted to intelligence. So score one for me, that works well <laughs> for me. But if a guy texted you know, my wife was dating a guy or whatever. If there was grammatical errors in his texts, if there were, you know, if he'd used crazy abbreviations or whatever, that was a non-starter for my wife. She wouldn't even want to talk to the guy. Right. So, so my wife was very impressed that I was able to articulate myself in a text grammatically correct and express a thought, whatever the case may be. But, um, I started sending her uh, dirty limericks. She loved <laughs> dirty limericks. So I, I do have a very, I, I've got a kind of a dark, dirty sense of humor. My, my wife loves that. Um, but yeah, I will, I will send my, and I still, like I said, she's away this weekend. So I'm going to send her, uh, I still do it. It's not like something I just did just when I was courting her and trying to woo her over. You know, if I go out of town or she's out of town, I'll still send her a dirty limerick and she loves it. So I like to send dirty limericks to my wife. Well, I think you brought up something important there. Uh, just throw this in. It's so important. I have a buddy. It says, uh, happily dating my wife for over 20 years. Yeah, I, I I get that now. There was a time I never could understand that. I looked at my, you know, my parents were together for 30 years. Then they got, you know, they, they got a divorce, you know, and I was just thought, all right, you get married, you know, you like each other, then you just tolerate each other and, you know, you, you stick it out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's completely different in, in, in this go around. And uh, so I, I get that. And I understand that. Odds you would share any dirty limerick with us? Probably not. Uh, okay. I say, if, I, I, say <laughs> no, I would not share that because I, yeah, no, I wouldn't, but uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't know if you had one, maybe that was out there publicly. No, they're all, no, they're all very or... spontaneous. I mean, there's been times my wife's been out with her girlfriends and I'll get a text from her. She's like, Hey, I'm here with so-and-so and so-and-so. 
text me a dirty limerick about this. Right. And so she likes to brag and look at this stuff she sent me. But no, I, w- I wouldn't put any of those dirty limericks out there now. <laughs> Understandable. Um, boy, being that you brought up uh, American Werewolf in London, John Landis, uh, who would you say? Would you say he's probably the one of the bigger influences for you when it came to film? I mean, Animal House and I mean, he did brilliant work even with Michael Jackson's thriller. I, I'm a John Landis fan. It depends on, you know, the context of the, um, you know, it depends on the decade. It, it depends on, you know, the genre. Um, I, one of the most interesting things that happened to me is like, you know, I went to film school, but for whatever reason, I never watched The Godfather when I was in film school. It was really Neither weird. Did I don't I. Know, we, yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, I never watched The Godfather. And then when I was dating my kid's mom, I lived in California. She lived in Utah and I was driving back and forth every other weekend. And I went to the library and I got, I got the unabridged copy of the Godfather on books on tape. And I was just hooked listening. I, I mean, it was like, what did I drive? I don't know how many hours it was from where I was at in California, but all the way up and all the way back, I managed, and it was to listen to this entire thing. It was like to the point where I was getting gas. I wanted to hurry up and get gas and get back in my car so I could, you know, hear hear what was going on. Then when I watched the movie, then of course, obviously, I gotta say it's you know the greatest film of all time. I you know so the any mob genre, whether it's um, you know Goodfellas or The Godfather, you know Casino. Now the interesting thing, you know, I also before I started doing hypnosis, when I was doing stand-up comedy, I did, uh, I wrote, produced, and directed a comedy, feature-length comedy about a mafia family from Jersey that was put in the witness relocation program to Utah um, called Mobsters and Mormons. So I always <laughs> had this fascination with, um, you know, mob stories. And then when I was going through doing the hypnosis training, we actually did past life regression. Oh. And um, I'm open to past life regression. So I was, we did a past life regression where I was hypnotized. Now I know I was hypnotized 100%. I know that I was in a hypnotic state. I know what that feels like. There's no doubt about that. The experience I had though, I, I go, okay, was this, was what I was coming to mind? Was it real? Or was it something that my mind was searching for on its own? I cannot definitively say one way or another of that. But when we did this experience, I was a, uh, my, one of my past lives was a mafia soldier in Chicago during the 1940s and fifties. So, um, you know, I, I realized I've kind of strayed a long way no, from I your, love it. your influence, <laughs> but I would always have to say, you know, if I look at an influence of the biggest influence of genre on me, not a person, mm-hmm. it would be mafia, you know, the, the, the Sopranos. That's what I loved when I directed my movie, we held some auditions in LA and, um, I had like five or six guys that were serious regulars on the Sopranos that had come and auditioned for me. And uh, one of them, uh, the, the the actor that played Joe Peeps, if you're familiar with yeah. uh, the Sopranos, Steve Buscemi goes and shoots this guy, Joe Peeps. Yep. And uh, I, Joe Maruzzo was, was the actor. I actually had him in, in my movie. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. So oh, I love it. After that, you go, the missus. Yeah. I was a gangster in the fifties. They called me Curly Joe. Yeah. <laughs> she thought it was fascinating. It she is. Was like, we, you know, yeah, it really is. Oh yeah. That would be really cool to, to dive into. I'm going to have to make a note of that. I've always been pretty fascinated by that. And, and yeah, Coppola is brilliant. Uh, I love Francis Ford Coppola and his work. And I, I too went to film and television school and, <laughs> fell into radio telling jokes in a bar. So um, <laughs> if you, if you, if you get a chance, um, was it, was it Hulu? It was her parent, maybe Paramount plus um, there's a, a, a one-off season. It's called the offer. Really, really good. Really good. Excellent. Oh no. I, that was a fabulous show. Um, what uh, did I have? another? Oh yeah. We'll finish up. This will be a fun one. Then I'll ask you to leave us with some final thoughts. Uh, if a movie was made about your life, uh, what genre would you want it to be and who would you want to play you? Oh, boy, that's a good question. I have no idea. I would, you know, it would have to be a comedy. It, that would just, it, it would be, it would be a comedy. Who would play me? I have that. I, I, I have no, you know, maybe we could do AI. AI is getting to the point where <laughs> AI can, you know, AI can play me. Uh, but so I, my- I, yeah, I honestly don't, don't know if I'd have a, you know, 
there there was a you know back in the day though um <clears throat> my wife one of the things that she always gets is she she has a striking resemblance to um Demi Moore oh. and that was every guy's pickup joke when they saw my wife has anybody ever told you you look just like Demi Moore and then of course my wife's line was has anybody ever told you you look like nobody Demi Moore would go out with <laughs> so she looks, you know, just like Demi Moore. And then, of, you know, with me, you know, I do the, you know, I do the shaved head thing. So mm-hmm. I had a bit like people would call us Bruce and Demi, you know, there for <sighs> a while. Uh, hey, I, you couldn't pick it. You know, that'd be pretty good uh, acting. You yeah. Know, at one yeah. time couple. Uh, John, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm glad that this came together. Uh, Thank you. I had a good time. I appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. I'm going to keep uh, digging into your work and 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 keep in touch. Uh, yeah, but absolutely. If uh, if you kind of have anything you want to throw out there, you know, there's a we talked about a lot of things that people are being confronted with, struggling on. What what might you you know just wrap a bow on it? You know, the thing that I say is that the only thing that stands between us and anything that we want to achieve, it's ourselves. It's not situations it's not people it's it's our minds and we can rewire and retrain and reprogram our minds to be able to go and achieve the life that we prefer have the experiences that we prefer the things that we prefer have the relationships that we prefer it's all possible it's just it's all right in here and and you can go in there and you can you can change that everything out here There's no out there. Out here doesn't make any difference. It's what's in here. That's what's going to make the difference. When you make that change in here, then everything around you starts to show up as a reflection of what you've got inside. John Moyer, thank you so much, man. Thank Um, you, sir. Appreciate it very much. You got it. On that note, everybody, keep knocking doors down. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about.